The deadline is January 20th. For more information, go to our website, studentcam.org. Next to form with the candidates for Ohio's first and second district seats in the U.S. House. Republicans Steve Shabbat and Brad Westrup faced Democrats after Purville and Jill Schiller. Topics included health care, the Kavanaugh hearings, gun control, infrastructure, foreign policy, and negative political ads. This is about an hour. Tonight, four candidates, two seats in Congress, and you get to decide. From Local 12 News, in conjunction with the American Jewish Committee and the Jewish Community Relations Council, this is the 2018 Congressional Candidates Forum. Now, here's your moderator, Jeff Hirsch. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. For the next hour, the candidates in Ohio's first and second congressional districts will discuss some of the issues facing voters when the voters go to the polls three weeks from tonight. Before we bring out the candidates, we want to tell you a little bit about them and where the districts are. The first district stretches from western Hamilton County east to downtown. It also cuts a narrow path across northern Hamilton County before jutting north to include all of Warren County. Vying for the first district seat is Democrat Aftab Purval. He's 36 years old and currently serves as Hamilton County Clerk of Courts. He's a graduate of Ohio State University and the UC College of Law. Prior to public service, he worked for Procter & Gamble as well as the U.S. Attorney's Office. He and his wife live downtown. Republican Steve Shabbat is the incumbent, having represented the first district for 22 of the past 24 years. He's 65 years old. Prior to being elected to Congress, he served as a Hamilton County Commissioner and a Cincinnati City Council member. He's a graduate of the College of William and Mary and NKU's Chase College of Law. He and his wife live in Westwood. Ohio's second congressional district runs from the eastern side of Hamilton County east all the way to Portsmouth. Democrat Jill Schiller is the challenger prior to the campaign. She ran a nonprofit focused on child literacy issues. She's a graduate of Ursinus College and has a law degree from Temple University. She lives with her husband and two children in Hyde Park. Republican Brad Wenstrup has represented the second district in Congress since 2013. He's 60 years old. Prior to politics, he worked as a podiatrist and surgeon and also rose to the rank of colonel in the Army Reserve. He's a graduate of the University of Cincinnati and holds a medical degree from Rosalind Franklin University. He lives with his wife and two children in Columbia, Tusculum. Now, please join me in welcoming all four candidates to the stage. Everybody get a chance to sit down? Okay, everybody comfortable? Good. You may have noticed that we are calling this a forum rather than a debate. The hope is that that promotes more of a discussion of issues. Here's a format agreed to by the candidates. A question will be posed to the candidates running against each other. There'll be five minutes for a discussion on that issue. It's my job to make sure the time is shared equally. The questions will go back and forth between the two races as time permits, and then each candidate will have a 30-second closing statement. So, we are now going to go to the first question, and the way this is structured, this will go the first district with Mr. Pival answering first and Mr. Shabbat answering second. So here's question number one. It is 1991, and you have just watched the Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas hearings and the subsequent Senate vote confirming Justice Thomas 52 to 48. Fast forward 27 years. You've just watched the Christine Blasey Ford, Brett Kavanaugh hearings, and the subsequent Senate vote confirming Justice Kavanaugh 50 to 48. Your reaction is, Mr. Pierval, you're first. Well, thank you so much for the honor of the first question. Thank you to our host, the AJC, the JCRC, to Local 12, and to you, Jeff. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my reaction to uh, the Kavanaugh confirmation is, is one of disappointment. Uh, unfortunately, it is more evidence of our country just utterly being torn apart with the divisiveness, with the cynicism, 
with the negative rhetoric. Uh, I agree with Senator Murkowski on this. I think uh, Justice Kavanaugh's confirmation works to continue to undermine one of our greatest democratic institutions, that is the Supreme Court of the United States, a body that should frankly be above politics. Uh, and unfortunately, the confirmation uh, makes people uneasy and, and, and unfortunately undermines the idea that our Supreme Court should be objective. But what I've seen over the past two years with the Me Too movement and brave women and girls coming forward to talk about the harassment and the abuse that they've experienced throughout their lives, no longer being silenced, coming forward and bravely speaking their truth, it's been incredibly inspiring. And I worry that the confirmation will deter these women and girls from coming forward because they fear they won't be believed in the future. All right, Mr. Shabbat, your uh, response to that question, please. Well, thank you very much. I want to also thank uh, AJC and, and uh, JCRC and Channel 12 for providing this great forum. And I don't want to thank all the folks out there uh, this evening uh, who are here in person and all the folks uh, that are watching this on, on Channel uh, 12 for taking their time to listen to all the candidates um, here. Uh, there, there's no place for sexual assault or exploitation in our society uh, ever. Um, and I think it was very disappointing to a lot of Americans to see uh, what happened uh, in our most recent Supreme Court uh, nomination, the process. Uh, there were so many things that this could have been handled differently that I think could have brought Americans together as opposed to the divisiveness uh, that we saw. Um, I think for one example, I think uh, at least the staff of Senator Feinstein, I think, did a great disservice to the country. Uh, she did a great disservice to uh, Dr. Ford, as well as uh, now Justice Kavanaugh, by not turning that information that she had access to over so it could have been investigated in a timely manner. Um, this came up basically at the 11th hour, and it put everybody in a position that I don't think uh, they needed to be in. Now, I watched this. I was in, uh, in Washington as, as this unfolded. We had committee meetings and votes, so I didn't get to watch every minute of it, but I watched a fair amount of it, both Dr. Ford uh, as well as uh, Justice Kavanaugh. And to be honest with you, I found both of them to be very credible people. Uh, they seem like very good people, um, and we'll probably never know for sure uh, exactly. Uh, this obviously happened a long uh, time ago. But that's why it was so unfortunate uh, that this didn't come up at a time that was more timely, uh, and we, we could have probably gotten to the, uh, to, the, to the truth of this matter and probably never will um, know that. I hope, and the unfortunate thing is, I happen to be on the, the Judiciary Committee in the House. I've been the chairman of the Constitution Committee before. My ranking member uh, for six years there was none other than Jerry Nadler, who's now the ranking member of the full Judiciary Committee. And Mr. Nadler, he's from New York. He's very liberal. I'm pretty conservative, but we get along quite well. But he, uh, he indicated that uh, if the Democrats take over the House this year, one of their intentions is to investigate this matter all over, uh, potentially Steve, uh, impeach I, I, this uh, man if possible, and I, I think hate, that I would do a disservice. Cut in, but we're trying to keep the time sure. roughly balanced. So, Mr. Pierval, did you want to respond to anything Mr. Shabbat just said? I, I would like to respond to that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm running for Congress to make a, a real difference for people and, and to improve their lives not to go to Congress to settle political scores uh, or to, frankly, uh, become a career politician whose priority is to get reelected over and over again. Uh, and you only need to look at my record when it comes to believing women and, frankly, empowering them. Uh, in law school, I worked at the Legal Aid Domestic Violence Clinic representing battered women who couldn't afford an attorney. And as the Hamilton County Clerk of Courts, we've invested uh, in first-of-its-kind technology here in the state to make sure that women who are uh, seeking temporary restraining orders are safe. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Shabbat and I disagree on this issue because he voted against the Violence Against Women Act. Thank you, Mr. Pivall. We are now going to move to the second district. And the way this order has been structured, we'll go to Ms. Schiller and Mr. Wenstrup in this order. Okay. Richard Newcomer, Pruthi Raj Kandepi, and Larice Calderon were the three people shot and killed about six weeks ago in the Fifth Third Center in downtown Cincinnati by a crazy man with a gun. Whitney Austin and Ryan Sarver were shot and wounded. What are you, 
willing to do to move us away from just thoughts and prayers? Are you willing to show leadership by going to your respective bases, whether it's a Second Amendment base or a gun control base, and say we have to compromise on something? And please address your responses to the survivors of the shooting and the relatives of those who were killed. Thank you. So first of all, first of all, I cannot express my deep sorrow and regret for your loss. I can only imagine the horror and my heart and thoughts are with you. But we do need more than thoughts and prayers. And specifically, there are measures we can take that will work. Now, I want to make this clear. I support the Second Amendment. My father was a hunter and grew up with guns in the house. So nobody is coming to take your guns away. What we do think would work would be to first fully repeal the Dickey Amendment so that we can do research and figure out exactly what this scourge is doing to our country. Finally, we can have common sense measures for safety regulations such as background checks and closing the gun show loophole. We should be able to have people insured and registered the same as we do with our cars. These are weapons that in the wrong hands are dangerous. And to the extent that the opposing party likes to point out that it can be a mental health issue as well, that's something else we need to address. We need to properly fund our mental health programs and make sure that we are implementing our red flag laws and background checks. Mr. Weinstein. Well, thank you. And I also want to thank AJC and JCRC and Channel 12 uh, for having the opportunity to be with you tonight. You know, this is a very sad and uh, difficult challenge for all of us in America. So many Americans have been affected. And it is beyond our thoughts and prayers. But we do extend them. And we go to work and we try and figure out why is this happening so often in America. You know, one of the things that we have done in Congress, and this was propo proposed a while back in a bipartisan fashion, was the Stop Violence Act that we got passed, which is to increase school safety and other measures that will enhance us at a local level to increase the safety in our areas. Many states have what's called the gun violence restraining order. And when that happens, what we have passed in Congress is for anybody who's put on the state gun violence restraining order would also go on the national instant criminal background check system. This is one step forward. I also recently signed on to a bill that addresses threat assessment. About 12 or 13 of the sad mass violent episodes that have happened in America have come and been acted upon by people who have been reported in some way, shape, or form, and nothing was done. The Capitol Police are very good at threat assessment. We rely on that in Washington, D.C. We report our threats to them. This bill would enable them and those like them to teach local communities how to better assess threats. We see a lot of violence in America today. I want to know why. I want to know why so many people in, in America are, are committing suicide. It's not just amongst our veterans, it's going up in our society. Where are we as a society, society that has accepted so much violence? It's on our TVs. It's everywhere we turn, unfortunately. I have two small children. My son watches Andy Griffith when we're in the car driving back and forth to D.C. Mental health is an issue. We've tried to engage more in that arena. And we have to be able to allow families to come forward and talk about their loved ones who may have an issue that we can address. Mr. Winston, I don't mean to cut you, but we got to try to keep these time sure. balanced. Ms. Shelley, did you want to uh, have a little more extra, maybe 30 seconds or so to just pick up on that? Yes, thank you. Um, all of these things are valid points. The society we live in is violent, but the violence is committed by people wielding guns. And so the idea that because we cannot stop all of these murders means we can't stop any of these murders, that we can't prevent all gun suicides so we can't prevent any, that doesn't make sense. These are basic common sense things and my opponent has just talked a lot about violence and mental health, but not about guns. It's a gun problem and we need a gun solution. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move back to the first district. And in this case, Mr. Shabbat will get the first response. Mr. Purevall will get the second response. This question is about the economy. Unemployment is at its lowest, its lowest rate since 1969, and economic growth is strong. If you are a Democrat, are you willing to acknowledge that the Trump Republican tax cuts have had a role in promoting this growth? 
And should those policies be continued? If you are a Republican, are you willing to acknowledge that the combination of tax cuts and spending increases have exploded the projected budget deficit and that might lead to cuts in programs such as Medicare? Mr. Shabbat, you're the Republican. You're first. <laughs> yeah. I think clearly the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that I voted for and my opponent indicated he would have voted against it has been tremendous for the economy. And that in conjunction with reducing a lot of the burdensome regulations in the economy has enabled this economy to move forward so well and created so many jobs for so many people. Um, we have the lowest rate of unemployment among African Americans, among Hispanic Americans, among Asian Americans that we've seen in our history. And we've got about a 50-year low for everybody, so we're moving in the right direction. I'm very concerned about uh, the deficit. There's a group called Citizens Against Government Waste that keeps track of our voting records, and I'm always, out of 435 members, either the top person or second or third or fourth, once in a while fifth, but usually in the top five for voting against wasteful spending, because I really do care about uh, the deficit. I do think we ought to have a constitutional amendment that requires us to balance the budget every year. Um, I think we ought to be disciplined enough to do it without amending the Constitution, but I know Congress, and we're just not. I am, but most aren't. Brad is, I can tell you he is as well, just because I know how he votes. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention, my, my opponent said something that was very misleading. He said in his ad that, that I voted against the Violence Against Women Act. Here's the truth on that. I have voted for the Violence Against Women Act, reauthorizing it probably 10 times in my time in Congress. What happened is the Democrats were in control in the Senate back in 2013, uh, to, in, in uh, 2013, and they decided to play games. We had passed the Violence Against Women Act in the House, and then the Senate added a whole bunch of uh, uh, illegal immigrants to be covered as well as additional visas for people. Um, so most of the conservatives in the House voted against that, not because we were against the Violence Against Women Act, which we had supported many times, but because we didn't think that illegal immigrants ought to be added in that bill. Mr. Pivol, I guess uh, you'd probably want to respond to that as well as the larger question we asked before about the tax cuts. Yeah, I guess what I would say is, unfortunately, it's, it's more evidence uh, that Steve Shabbat is interested in pointing fingers and blaming others. Uh, Mr. Shabbat, your, your vote speaks for itself. You voted against the, the Violence Against Women Act, uh, and, and we just fundamentally disagree on that. Uh, we also d disagree on, on these tax cuts. I I'm for tax cuts for middle-class families and for working-class families. I'm for tax cuts for small businesses. But unfortunately, that's not what happened. Uh, what happened was uh, the richest uh, Americans in our country uh, got a lot, and working class and middle class families didn't get enough. Here are the facts. This tax cut, 83% of the benefit goes to the richest 1% in our country. Once it's fully implemented, 92 million American families' taxes will actually go up. And unfortunately, it blows a nearly $2 trillion hole in our deficit, which now puts Social Security and Medicare at risk. And unfortunately, uh, the opposing party has, has said that Social Security is an entitlement. Well, these folks, senior citizens, have worked hard to earn that benefit. And they know, and I know, and the voters in the 1st Congressional District know, that voting for a tax cut on the backs of middle class families to benefit the richest people in our country, that's not political. That's just not right. It's not fair. And I'm frankly surprised that Mr. Shabbat brought up the deficit, because while he's been in Congress, the deficit has exploded, $15 trillion. And just this past year, it went up nearly $2 trillion because of this tax cut. Uh, I, on the other hand, have been working in government to, to make it more efficient, uh, to make it more technologically advanced, and the results speak for themselves. In my time at the Clerk of Court's office, we've re reduced the size of government and saved taxpayers nearly $1 million. That's the kind of, of effectiveness that people want to see in D.C. We've got about a minute between the two of you, so I want to follow up on that. I mean, the deficit, there is a deficit, which presumably has to be covered. Give me two or three things quickly that you think could be cut, whether there's a big deficit or not. Ag subsidies, corporate welfare, that I voted against consistently. Now, those are a couple of examples. We've got a whole range of things. I can give a whole list here. But let me go back again to one thing he said uh, about the tax cuts. Recently, in a questionnaire he filled out, he said he would not 
be in favor of making the tax cuts on the middle class permanent. That's not true. He says he's, it absolutely is true. That's I'll provide true, that. Mr. At the end of this, we'll provide the exact thing that he said that. Did you want to just quickly give me a couple I just, things I, I, cut? What I'll just quickly say is that's, that's just fundamentally not true. I'm interested in a tax cut for small businesses, for middle class and working class families. For the middle class, I'm, I'm not interested in blowing a nearly $2 trillion hole in the deficit. And, and to attack the deficit, I would do what I've done in the clerk of court's office. Listen, government is bloated, it's inefficient, it's antiquated. We need to apply good private sector uh, management techniques to, to drive down those inefficiencies. Hate to cut you off, but time is what it is. We've got to keep moving along. This one is now for the second district. We'll start with Mr. Wenstrup and then go to Ms. Schiller. Is access to health care in this country a right? If not, why not? If yes, what do we as a nation need to do to cover as many people as possible at a cost that we as a country can afford? I know we could talk about this for months. Yes. But you got basically <laughs> two and a half minutes apiece. Yeah, complicated subject. But you know, as a doctor, there's no part of me that doesn't want people to have access to quality care that's affordable. And uh, if you look at the bill that we passed in the House of Representatives, we covered pre-existing conditions and we covered 26-year-olds uh, to be able to be on their parents' insurance. But as, as, as we look at what we are faced with today, you, you see a situation where people don't have much choice and they are often strapped with having to buy what the government provides and the individual mandate now has been repealed. We've got to open up choices. I want people to have choices about their health care and, the, and the decisions should come down between the doctor and the patient. When I first started in practice, I had two employees and when patients came in, they knew what things cost and I gave them their bill and they paid it and then they submitted it to insurance. And now things have changed dramatically. We can do a whole lot more, and we can do a lot to cut costs in, in health care today, and we're, we're working on doing that. And so we will continue to strive to get things to patients that they need and that they want and open up the markets, because if you have a free market, you can bargain. I was at church where a woman cut off the priest during church when he was asking for funds for the Archbishop's Fund Drive, and she said, you don't know what it's like out here today. What I'm paying for health insurance is through the roof, and God forbid if I get sick because I can't afford that either. And that's because of the Affordable Care Act, and I know because I'm on it too as a member of Congress, we're on the Affordable Care Act. Michelle? Yes. Um, the health care issue, obviously, as you said, we could talk about it for months, but I think the framing of this is very important. First off, as my opponent said, they did recently pass a bill that mentioned pre-existing conditions. However, the plans that would cover these pre-existing conditions have no impetus to be affordable at all for the people with these conditions. They could also cover the patient and not cover the treatment. As a doctor, I would think that do no harm would be his first rule. However, by knocking the mandate out of the of the Affordable Care Act. They've introduced chaos into the market that won't be seen until after this election cycle. It's so important to provide health care for everybody because too many people live one medical emergency away from destruction and too many people are dependent upon employer-provided health care. The reason that national health care was a conservative idea in the first place was because it would free up so much capital from our employers, both large and small. And with that capital, how many new jobs would we have? How many new products? What an economic engine it would be. And we have the infrastructure between Medicare and Medicaid and the VA. We can streamline it. We can provide it to everybody. We need to be very thoughtful about it because it is a sixth of our economy that the Republicans have played games with because of political points. These are people's lives at stake and we should do everything we can to protect them. We have a little more time on this question, so I want to throw a couple of things out, and we'll go back to Mr. Winstrup first just to keep the order about a minute apiece. I'll throw out two phrases, Medicare for all and single payer. Yeah, Medicare for all is very unaffordable, and why would you want to take away insurance from so many people that have a plan? Uh, single payer is, is in the same vein. And what we have seen with single payer type systems is that care is often very restricted. And I think that that would be detrimental to, to America. 
When it comes to the pre-existing conditions component that, that was just talked about, Colorado, for example, had a very good high-risk pool that worked very well. And when it went to the Affordable Care Act and what they had in place, their costs started going up and the access started to be denied. And I recently led a story about someone who told their very story with the pre-existing condition. So I would, I would say that we have opportunities to cover people with pre-existing conditions. It's important. Look, my, my sister has a daughter. Mr. Wish, that, I'm sorry, I've, I've got to keep the time flowing. So Ms. Schiller, it's, it's your turn for about a minute or so. If you want of it. course. So my younger son has some mild developmental delays and medical care is something that's very important to me and my family. And I know too many other families in the same situation who aren't lucky enough to have strong employer-provided health care. The resources are there in this country, certainly by repealing this wealthy welfare of a tax cut, would pay for so much of the programming, especially when combining with resources we already have in place to do the same sort of thing. Therefore, I think that this is nothing but a no-brainer and, quite honestly, mean-spirited. Thank you very much. We're going to move back now to the first district. I feel like a ping pong ball moving back and forth here, but that's okay. In this case, Mr. Purevol will go first, and then Mr. Shabbat will go second. This question is about infrastructure. When Barack Obama was president, he came to Cincinnati and spoke in the shadow of the Brent Spence Bridge. Brent Spence Bridge is hard to say. About the need for an expanded infrastructure program. Not long after President Trump was elected, he came to the Cincinnati area, but down the Ohio River and talked about the need for an expanded infrastructure program. Does the Brent Spence Bridge have to fall into the Ohio River for anything to get done? And I say that facetiously, but you get the point. What is your specific infrastructure plan and proposal? Does it include tolls for a new Brent Spence Bridge? And above and beyond the Brent Spence, what about an increase in the national gasoline tax to help pay for infrastructure programs. Mr. Pierval, you are first. No, I, I don't believe we need uh, tolls or a gas tax. Washington seems to be perfectly fine uh, with, with finding money to, uh, to fund its priorities. And, and frankly, the infrastructure uh, of the United States, and specifically the infrastructure of, uh, of the first congressional district, has to be a priority. And unfor unfortunately, it hasn't been a priority. Uh, unfortunately, we've had leadership in, in Congress with, with Mr. Shabbat, who's had 22 years to do anything about the Brent Spence Bridge or the Western Hills Viaduct. Uh, when Mr. Shabbat's in the district, presumably he drives over this, this bridge, the Western Hills Viaduct in particular, every day. Uh, and unfortunately, he's either not aware that it's a problem or he simply doesn't care. But it's literally raining concrete. The Brent Spence Bridge is a, is a national problem. The Western Hills Viaduct for the last 12 years has been found to be structurally unsound. And because we don't have strong leadership in Washington, D.C., our tax dollars from Warren County and from Hamilton County are going to fund infrastructure projects in Pennsylvania, in, in Florida, in Kentucky, but not here in the first congressional district. And so we need to, frankly, elect new people who are more interested in driving results, who are more interested in getting stuff done rather than being a career politician running year after year with very little to show for it. I, I'm eager to work with President Trump, with Republicans and Democrats to come together and to rebuild our bridges and roads. Specifically on the Western Hills Viaduct, it's going to create thousands and thousands of jobs that are good paying, with good benefits, that can't be outsourced. That's what people are looking for, real leadership. Mr. Shabbat, your turn. Yeah, the Brent Spence Bridge is critical. That's one of our most critical infrastructure projects. I've uh, been working on this a long time. I'd like to say that we've got it done. Uh, we don't yet. Um, we've been working in a bipartisan manner with both Republicans and Democrats. We've got $53 million so far uh, for the Brent Spence, and we're working on the Western Hills Viaduct as well. We've got $5 million. We think we have another 10 coming, uh, hopefully more after that. Um, my opponent says we haven't worked on uh, these things. We're not looking at them. It's just not true. Maybe uh, if he had lived in the district a little longer than moving into it the day before he announced he was running uh, for Congress, he'd know a little bit more about the different things that we've worked on. Again, in a bipartisan manner. Um, 
the Waldvogel Viaduct is another one that connects Price Hill. We got $16 million for that uh, to the downtown. Fort Washington Way, millions for that. That's the area basically that connects downtown to the banks. Uh, for the riverfront uh, parks there, Interstate 71 and 75 quarters. Uh, the Martin Luther King Interchange. I could go on and on. He's been saying, oh, he hasn't done anything in 22 years and he hasn't done anything about this. It's just not true. It's just talking points that they get from the DCCC, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. They repeat this kind of stuff all over the country. It's just not true. The bottom line is we need to work together in a bipartisan manner. And we've been doing that on the, if you use the Western Hills Viaduct as an example, we've been doing it. Everybody here had been working on it except for one person, my opponent. He decided to make it a political point. He's done one thing for the Western Hills Viaduct, and that's mentioned it in one of his ads, but he's not actually done anything constructive to make it happen. Um, it's been an honor to represent the folks here on these things and a whole range of other things, and we'll continue to try to bring the funding back here for these important infrastructure uh, projects. And we're going to get the Brent Spence Bridge done. I don't think we need to go for the Brent Spence, but the local folks have to decide how the, how the local money is going to be arranged. That's Ohio and Kentucky and ODOT and those folks have to do it together. But together we're going to get this thing done. Mr. Pivot, did you want to respond? Yeah, Mr. Shabbat. 40 seconds. Mr. Shabbat, I'm not sure if you know this, but I'm actually the Hamilton County Clerk of Courts. My, my position has nothing to do with the Western Hills Viaduct. You unfortunately can't say the same thing. You've been in Congress for 22 years. You've had two decades to do anything about this infrastructure project, and the results speak for themselves. The bridge is literally raining concrete. Uh, and unfortunately, what we've seen from Mr. Shabbat with this answer is just more personal attacks and smears. He's, he's running a campaign of overwhelming, relentless negativity. And it's because he's trying to distract you from the fact that he's been there since 1994, and we have very little to show for it. I live in the district. The people of the first congressional district know me. They know I went to law school here. They know I served as a special assistant United States attorney in the district. They know that I'm a P, that I was a P&G attorney in the district. Well, as the gotta, clerk of courts, I, I currently represent 80% of the first congressional district. I gotta district. cut you off here because we do have to move on. We're trying to keep the time balanced. So we're gonna move back to the second district. There's a question on foreign policy. This goes to Ms. Schiller first and then Mr. Winstrup. Which of the following nations presents the biggest threat to the United States? And you can only pick one. <laughs> These are the SATs. <laughs> Russia, with his attempt to hack our elections and disrupt Western democracy. Iran, with its support for terrorism and efforts to destabilize the Middle East. North Korea, its dictator with nuclear weapons. And China, with its economic and growing military power. You might consider them all of a threat but for the purpose of this answer, please just pick the one you think would be the biggest threat. These are tough SATs. They're all big threats to our national security. I would say that the biggest threat to our national security comes from Russia because the efforts that they have put forth to undermine our electoral process and our democracy has been growing unchecked for years. And we have admitted and acknowledged that they have interfered in our elections and yet nothing's been done to stop this from happening again. With influence over our electoral process, they can control foreign and domestic policy. They can control the outcomes that they want. They can control the United States of America and that to me seems extremely un-American to say the least. This is the core of our democracy, our right to vote and that we are treating it so cavalierly and allowing people to interfere with it is unacceptable. And the inaction on the part of the current Congress and President is unacceptable as well. Mr. Winsor. Yeah, uh, they're all threats. There's no doubt about it. I serve on the Intelligence Committee and I get reports on each and every one of them every day. China is a problem that we face today and America needs to understand this and it's being understood around the world in places like Australia. China has a long-term plan. China has engaged in our universities. China has engaged in our businesses. China has engaged in cyber warfare. You know, we've put a lot of sanctions against, this president has put more sanctions against Russia than we've seen in a long, long time and will continue to do so. We're being tough on Russia. And also when it comes to Iran, that's a problem as well. And you see we're being tough on Iran and you see we're also being tough on North Korea and trying to make some progress in those areas. But China is the threat to me in long term. They all try to interfere in our elections and we have been doing things in Congress. We have been doing things within the intelligence community to upgrade what we are doing to try and manage who is coming in, how they're coming in, what type of things they're doing to try and influence and divide America. There's no doubt Russia has been involved 
involved with that to a, to a large degree. It's a serious problem, and we are addressing it, at least in the Intelligence com Committee, and I think that we need to do it even more. But America is aware of it today, and we have to do it at every level, at the local elections and on the national front. Got a little more time in the foreign policy area, so let me ask you this. How confident are you, both of you, in the president's efforts to reign in North Korea? Do you think it'll bring fruit, or is it just not going to work? And I think it's Ms. Schiller's turn to go first. It certainly seems that the president, in terms of his engagement with North Korea, has been a puzzle for American presidencies dating back decades. And it certainly isn't a problem that will be solved in one short summit where no preparation or plan was put in place. Clearly, we are seeing that none of the supposed agreements that were come to in that summit are being acted upon in any kind of good faith by North Korea. And I think that if we are not fully aware of what it is that they're doing, we are losing control of our own national security environment. Uh, I think the ping pong ball is a, is a good analogy, and it's something that has to be done as opposed to nothing. Um, you know, sadly, we lost Otto Warmbier from our district and lost him at the hands of the North Koreans. And I know firsthand, working with the Warmbier family and the previous administration, we were trying so much to get information to find out what was going on with Otto. Otto came home, sadly, but he is at peace and he is at rest. And, un and with that, we have also seen that North Korea has come to the table, which they never did before. So I'll take that ping pong ball match. I serve with Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, and I have complete confidence in his ability to work through this. And hopefully at the end of the day, we have good results where they are no longer a threat to the United States and to the world. Thank you. We're going to move back over to the first district. And let's see, this is Mr. Shabbat gets to go first and then Mr. Pierball. I'd like to bring up a little known piece of proposed congressional legislation which would have allowed 20,000 children into the United States from a country where they were in serious danger. That's 20,000 more people than the U.S. was allowing in from that nation. This country was not Syria, it was not Yemen, it was not Guatemala, it was not Nicaragua, it was not Honduras. It was Nazi Germany, the year was 1939. The legislation died in Congress and many of those children no doubt died in the Holocaust. Our children dying now because of our current refugee and immigration policies. Certainly, uh, what you've referred to back during uh, the Holocaust, uh, it was a human tragedy. And much of the world, including the United States, uh, turned its back on far too many people who didn't deserve to have happened to them what did. And, and we should never forget that, especially at the type of venue that we're at uh, this evening. Um, relative to our immigration laws, we are, we are a compassionate nation, and we do allow in a tremendous number of immigrants every year. Um, we do, I think, as a nation, we're a sovereign nation, we do have a right uh, to have border security and make sure that the American people are secure. The people that are coming into our country are going to benefit those folks that are already uh, here. Um, and. You know, we probably have somewhere between 11 and 25 million people that are here uh, that are either undocumented or illegal, whatever terminology one prefers. Um, but I think before we come to some conclusion as to whether those, per those people ultimately will stay or whether they return to their country, ultimately what happens, we need to make sure that we actually have security at our borders. And that's what President Trump has talked about. He's gotten a lot of uh, negativity from some folks about wanting to build a wall. I agree with him. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that the entire border has to have a wall, but part of it has to be that. Um, and, and some of it, uh, you know, you can do it in other ways nowadays. But ultimately, we have to secure that border for a number of reasons. And then I think being the compassionate nation we are, we will be able to come to a reasonable understanding as to what we do with the folks uh, that are already here. I think a lot of them will probably return, some of them will be able to stay, but we ought to do that as, an, as a people. And, it is, and, and I think we ought to do it in a bipartisan manner and we ought to put the finger pointing aside. Hopefully one day we'll do that. Mr. Pierval. On this issue, it's, it's very simple. Uh, we know that there is a bipartisan common sense solution we know that it starts with securing the border with 21st century technology to make sure that we're keeping dangerous people out. And we know that we have to come together as a country and make sure 
that those who are here, who want to stay here, who want to work and be productive citizens, that they have a path to citizenship. That's the way forward. That's the bipartisan, common sense solution. But unfortunately, on this issue, like so many others, it's evidence of just how broken and how toxic Washington, D.C. is. Because instead of rolling up our sleeves and, and getting anything done, our leaders in D.C. have resorted to finger pointing and to blame, rather than taking responsibility and creating any change. Mr. Shabbat, I agree. The time that Jeff just mentioned was a sad time where America did turn its back on the vulnerable. But that's happening right now. Because we don't have strong leadership in Congress, we haven't fulfilled our commitment to the DACA kids. Family separation is happening at the border in our country. And unfortunately, after 22 years, what you hope and ought to get accomplished is, a, is far little, far late. It's time we have new leadership that will prioritize driving results on immigration and so many other issues. I'm going to put immigration and the budget together. We got about well, maybe a minute and a half between the two of you. The president obviously campaigned on building the wall and said Mexico is going to pay for it. Obviously, Mexico not going to pay for it. Do we, if we build the wall, however defined, electronic, physical, it's expensive. What don't you pay for to build the wall, or don't you not? You don't build the wall. I think it's Mr. Shabbat's turn. I'm not quite sure if I understood that question, Jeff. Well, I'll rephrase the question. <laughs> if we build the wall and we pay for it, what don't we pay for to pay for the wall? Well, there's How are we to find the wall? Yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. I mean, obviously, you have to prioritize what you're going to pay for. And Social Security, obviously, payment of that comes in advance. Our military comes in, in, in advance of those things. But this is also an important issue because we actually have uh, people that come here and bring dangerous things like opioids. Uh, they, they bring... Uh, her heroin and a whole range of, of, of things. I was actually visited the border a couple of times and we went down 90 feet in, into tunnels that the cartels had, had built and they bring this stuff into the country and it's death. Uh, we didn't, maybe we will be talking about the opioid epidemic, but it's absolutely critical and we need to deal seriously with that. Mr. Chairman, I got to give Mr. Pirlo a little chance here. No, what, what we need to do is invest in real technology and real apparatus and, and strategies that's going to secure our border, that's going to actually secure our border. That's not just a photo op or, or a political line. What we need is real leadership to secure that border, and that only comes with investments in technology. Okay, we're going to move over to the other district now. and. Mr. Winstrup, you're first, Ms. Schiller, you're second. Is there any realistic hope for a lasting peace between Israel and the Palestinians? It's been 70 years, mm -hmm. and now it's your turn. What should we do, what can we do, and why is it relevant for somebody in, I don't know, West Union, that's in your district? Well, I think it's relevant from the standpoint that Israel is one of our greatest allies, and we'd like to see peace in the region. And we have done a few things, such as reducing our aid to, to Palestine, especially if it's going to fund terrorism. You know, Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. It is an ally of the United States. We share so many things. From military to military, we are strong. From medicine to medicine, we are strong. But this still continues to take place. If you look what we have seen in recent years, I've seen Israel offer peace. And what's coming out of too many on the Palestinian side is terror instead. And although Mr. Abbas has been in charge for quite some time in Palestine, um, maybe his time is fading, and that would be helpful, I believe, because he wants to hold on to continue the battle between the two. But I see in Israel a nation that wants to seek peace and wants to come up with a two-state solution. And I hope that we can accomplish that and hope the United States can continue to work with both sides uh, and get that done. Ms. Schiller. I agree that our relationship with Israel is indeed a special relationship, much like our relationship with the UK. It is the hallmark, the stalwart of democracy in the Middle East. And I personally have a deep concern for our relationship with Israel. Um, as the wife of a Jewish man raising Jewish children, it's very important to me that we maintain our relationship with Israel and help with their security. We need to focus on building relationships with the, within our international community where they know they can count on us. Our recent 
departure from international agreements means that you know, the world is looking at America and they're not sure if they can count on our word anymore. Both our friends and our enemies think that our word is no longer our bond and I don't think that that's the best way to go about maintaining peace in the Middle East or anywhere else in the world. We got a little more time on this, so I'll ask you your, your opinion of the president's policies towards Iran and whether that is making the region more secure, less secure. And I don't mean just Israel, I mean the whole region. Mm -hmm. I think it's Mr. Wenstrom's turn. Yeah, I think the posture towards Iran is appropriate. I think we are getting out of a bad deal where we gave $1.4 billion to them in cash and so that they could turn it on, on Americans. I served in Iraq, and the IEDs that were blowing us up were coming from Iran. We got to take a tough stance with them. It's, it's not just about giving them money to slow down their nuclear process, but to get them to change as a nation. And I have even greater concern because of their attempted influence in the region. And they are anti-American. Let's be, let's be serious about this. They are very anti-American. They're trying to reach out and have their influence throughout the entire region. And I'm glad that the president is standing up to them. And hopefully with uh, sanctions and everything, we can bring them to the table in a way that maybe we never thought we would see. Ms. Schiller? I don't think anybody here thinks the JCPOA was a perfect agreement. However, it did remove from the table nuclear threats, which would have allowed us to address Iran's, Iran's other human rights violations and other issues without that threat of nuclear. However, by backing away from the JCPOA, we've lost that, and now that's back on the table. Further, that makes us one of the only countries in the world not part of this agreement. And if you're not at the table, you're not making the policy. We're going to move back now to the first district, and the order here is Mr. Pirval, followed by Mr. Shabbat. A few weeks ago, the station received an email from a viewer specifically about the 1st Congressional District. It said in part, I am writing you about the negative campaign ads. The ads make it seem like both candidates should be in jail, not running for office. <laughs> it's a real letter. How can they lie on each other and confuse the public and get by with it? It astonishes me. There's more to that email, but you get the point. At a time when the country is so divided, don't ads like these turn people off and harm our democracy? Why run them? I know some of the ads are technically not from you guys, but from groups. But it's unlikely voters really can tell the difference in the fine print who paid for it. Why do this? Why not try to be more positive overall? I agree. And that's why I have run a positive, substantive campaign. Um, because I, I believed running for Congress was going to be a, a great debate about ideas and policies, optimistic views about how to move our country forward. And I'm proud to say that's the kind of campaign that we're running. Unfortunately, my opponent disagrees. He's committed to a campaign of, of negativity, of, of smears, and, and unfortunately of, of outright lies. And we have to ask ourselves why. Why after 22 years in Congress, is Mr. Shabbat running such a negative campaign? His very first campaign ad in this campaign was a negative attack ad, a personal attack. And I'm not even sure he's run a positive ad. Every single ad since then has been an overwhelming and unrelenting negative attack. And the answer to why is because after two decades, since 1994, he has very little to show for it. Mr. Shabbat has been running for office for 40 years. And on top of that, not only does he have a very thin record, but he's wrong on the big issues facing our community. He voted repeatedly to eliminate protections for those with pre-existing conditions. He voted to continue to rig the economy against the middle class and working class families with this tax bill. And on infrastructure, he's completely missing from the scenario. I want to offer something better, something positive, keeping good paying jobs here in Ohio, making college more affordable, protecting your access to health care. And it's not just me saying that he's run negative ads. The Inquirer says so, PolitiFact says so. Even today, he refuses to denounce an ad that the Inquirer says engaged in dog whistle politics. It's this kind of cynical politics, it's this kind of negative campaigning that's driving our country apart, which is why we need a new generation of leadership to bring people together and to move people forward. Mr. Shep. Mr. Pirovall, I don't even know where to begin with that. Um, this gentleman says that he's running a positive campaign and all this high-spirited talk, and then he attacks me time after time after time, most of it being completely distorted, whether it's you 
or whether it's the DCCC or one of these other liberal groups, they started off attacking me for allegedly not doing town halls. Um, we switched over, as most members of Congress did, to telephone, tall, telephone town halls years ago because they're much more efficient. We can spend a whole lot less money and include a whole lot more people on the calls, answer a lot more questions, and it's a lot cheaper, and they don't even have to leave their homes or pay any gas. People compliment me on doing those all the time. But that was the first thing they attacked. Then they attacked me for uh, allegedly voting uh, against pre-existing condition coverage. You did? Which is, no, I didn't. You're wrong. Yes, That's you did, absolutely sir. wrong. Your is he allowed to keep interrupting like that? I, I thought we weren't supposed to be let doing that. Let him finish. Yeah, let him Give finish. All. all right. I voted against, as many of us promised to do, to repeal Obamacare and to replace it with a better plan. Yes, there was pre-existing conditions in Obamacare, and yes, there was pre-existing conditions in our replacement plan. Now, ultimately, it didn't pass in the law because Senator McCain famously went over and gave the thumbs down. So that's not the law. If you don't like your health care right now, what we're stuck in this nation is Obamacare, which you're for. I think the American people deserve better. You attack me for travel. Now, let me, before I even get into that, you attack me for allegedly voting uh, to increase our pay six times. That's an absolute lie. Every time we've had an opportunity to vote on a, on a pay hike, I have voted no. And so I asked my staff, how can they even argue this? What they did, they go back now, and there's these big CRs, these big spending bills that put a thousand, thousands of things in there. And we haven't had a pay hike in like 12 years, and we shouldn't. Um, so a lot of the conservatives vote against these CR bills because they spend too much. Since there's not a pay hike in there, they say you're voting for a pay hike if you vote against all that spending. That's the only basis that they could say, and it's just absolutely wrong. They say, I travel. I'm on the Foreign Affairs Committee. It's our responsibility. Don't you want us to do our job? We have oversight over a $50 billion State Department budget. We want to make sure that the people of this country's tax dollars are being spent wisely overseas. It's our responsibility to do that. There isn't a week that goes by that I don't have a member of the Knesset or the Bundestag or the, or the legislative uh, yuan in Taiwan or somebody in my office, and we meet with them there, and we're expected to meet with our counterparts Chabot, in their countries. I, I gotta let, so I gotta let lie Mr. after Kuval, lie after lie. I got to let Thank Mr. Kuval have about 30 seconds to get back. Um, let well, me ask, answer Mr. Shabbat's question. Do I want you to do your job? I do. Unfortunately, you've had 22 years to do your job, and according to you, you're just getting started. I think we can do better. We have to do better. On the teletown halls, on, on the travel, the facts speak for themselves. You've taken 76 taxpayer-funded trips, costing $250,000. No wonder you like teletown halls. You can do them from Paris. You haven't been around the district to know that people are struggling, that they're trying to make ends meet. And instead of working to make their lives better or their, increase their wages, Thanks, you continue it. to vote against their interests. Thank you. This man doesn't even know what he's All talking right, we gotta, about. We've got to move on. <laughs> we're, we're running, we're squishing this down, okay? So we're going to run down real quick. You've got about a minute apiece on this. I know it's a biggie, but it starts with Ms. Schiller. Should Congress pass legislation to protect the Mueller investigation? Yes. Um. <laughs> I, I don't think I need a minute for this. I think that we have seen indications that the independent counsel is not going to be able to, I'm sorry, the special counsel is not going to have the security to finish his investigation in peace. I think we've seen repeated indications from the executive branch that they intend to interfere with this and possibly will. And quite honestly, protection, protecting this investigation only means that we will get to some answers regardless of what the outcome would be. So I don't see why Congress would not act to make sure that we can get those answers, whether they fully exonerate or implicate anybody in the government. Mr. Winstrup. Yeah, I don't think we need to pass any legislation on it because I think it's taking place. And I have said since the very beginning that it should run its course. And the truth should come out, and we want transparency for all Americans to know what's going on within their government. I serve on Intelligence Committee. We've done a lot of investigations ourselves. We don't comment on the Mueller investigation. We let it go on in independently as it should. If someone has done wrong in America, then we should know about it. So go ahead and continue the investigation, but let's get it done. I think America America has grown tired of waiting. Much like the House Intelligence Committee has grown tired of their own investigations into it. Ten seconds if you want to get back at that. We completed our investigation. We did. We had over 300,000 files, over 70 interviews in two years and found no signs of collusion with the Trump campaign. If Mueller finds some, then bring it forward. If Democrats find some, bring it forward, but we haven't seen it. I shouldn't and have said honestly, get back at that. It would have been leaked by now. To it. All right, now that we've all been going back and forth, 
I want to ask, we're going to go to closing statements. I ran out of questions. All right, we're closing statements. I apologize for that. And we're going to go with Mr. Wenstrup. Each have 30 seconds. Thank you very much. Statements. You know, I grew up watching Superman in black and white, and they always talked about truth, justice, and the American way. And I bought into that, and I believe in that. And I am proud that I live in a country where we get to elect our leaders. You know, in the United States of America, we have much to be thankful for, but we have so much more to do. We always will. You know, I, I also uh, believe that we are a country that can do so much. In, in just America the Beautiful, the song, we talk about God, asking God to mend our every, every flaw. And I would ask that you send me back to continue to try and do that. It's my honor to represent the second district, and I humbly ask for your vote. Ms. Schiller. You know, I'm not a politician, despite what the attack ads levied against me say. I'm a mom, I'm a concerned citizen, and I want to represent the people of the 2nd District who have been ignored by a representative who lives in D.C., who has not addressed the fact that 70,000 people in our district are on the Medicaid expansion, that we have t counties in our district where unemployment is at 7 percent regardless of what the national rate is. We have a raging opioid epidemic that goes unchecked, and we have somebody who is do not doing their job. I have been around this district. I have met with many people. I've made a pledge to be there on the ground to represent sure, these people. I need to give everybody the okay. equal time to move on. Okay, Mr. Shabbat, you've got 30 seconds for your close. The University of Virginia and Vanderbilt did a study of the most effective members of Congress, both Republicans and Democrats, and uh, they found me to be the seventh most effective out of 240 Republicans in Congress. And if all the charges that my opponent has made against me were true, uh, that wouldn't be the case. Drugs are a big problem. A lot of elected officials came out yesterday and said they were against issue one. Uh, my opponent has been silent on that. I think this would be a pretty good time for him to indicate where he's at. I'm against it. Mr. Pivall, this is your 30-second close. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, this election provides a very clear distinction between two different visions for our country and for our district. Steve Shabbat has had his chance. He's been in Congress for 22 years, been running for for office for 40 years, and we have very little to show for it. And what's worse is he's wrong on the big issues facing our community, health care, education, infrastructure, the economy. I want to offer something better, something more positive. I want to bring us together and create real change in the first congressional district. He's more of the same, and we're offering something new and something better. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Pierval, and thank you to all of the candidates for participating tonight. Early voting is already underway at your County Board of Elections, and of course you can do it by mail. Election Day is three weeks away, and November 6th, Local 12 will have complete coverage. Election night and every step of the way between now and then. Our thanks to the American Jewish Committee and the Jewish Community Relations Council for their help with tonight's event. I'm Jeff Hirsch. Good night, and now you can applaud again for the candidates. With the midterm elections just days away, watch the competition for the control of Congress on C-SPAN.